That being passed to o'clock, I call on questions. Senator O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to Senator Hill, representing the Minister for Trade. Is the Minister aware of the statement by the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry on the 4th of March 2003 that Australia's quarantine system and our single desk for wheat are not up for grabs as part of the free trade agreement negotiations with the United States? Is he also aware of advice by the, his, uh, by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee on the 13th of February this year that I quote, the government's consistent position in relation to the free trade agreement negotiations with the United States has been that no sector or issue would be excluded from the scope of the free trade agreement negotiations. Given these completely contradictory statements, who is telling the truth on this matter? The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade or the Minister for Agriculture? Uh, the Minister, Senator. Ian Macdonald. Sorry, Senator Hill. Um, well, Senator Macdonald might have given a better answer. I don't know, but the, um, uh, as I understand the situation, uh, no sector has been explicitly excluded. However, we have interests that we would obviously wish to preserve during the negotiation, uh, and in particular I refer to the quarantine issue that was alluded to in the question. Uh, our quarantine laws have designed genuine quarantine reasons and not as a form of um, uh, trade uh, blockage, and therefore we would want to protect them for genuine quarantine reasons. So the answer therefore is that um, that within this negotiation, Australia will obviously seek an outcome that not only maximises our trade advantage, uh, but preserves uh, security that's been put in place for quarantine and like matters. A supplementary question, Senator O'Brien. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. And I, uh, I note that uh, uh, the minister says that uh, uh, those matters are on the table for negotiations. And I wanted to, to know, can the minister guarantee that no change to the single desk arrangements or our quarantine standards or systems will be forced onto Australia as a consequence of any proposed free trade agreement with the United States? That's the question that I think Australia's, Australians <coughs> want answered. Senator Hill. As I, as I said, uh, Mr. President, um, uh, we're not going to we're not going to agree to an outcome that uh, that puts us at risk. That's why we have quarantine rules and regulations, and we will quarantine what system? Did you say? That's why. We, well, I said rules. And, I said rules and regulations. And practices. We'll say practices as well, and we'll obviously want to preserve those because uh, they're critically important to the well-being of Australian agriculture, to um, Australia's protecting Australia's biodiversity, good environmental reasons, a whole range of sound reasons that are, that are unrelated to issues of trade. And for those very sound reasons, uh, obviously uh, our quarantine rules will be preserved. Senator Ferris. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Family and Community Services and the Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Status of Women, Senator Vanstone. Will the minister inform the Senate of the circumstances of the women of Iraq under the regime of Saddam Hussein? Senator Vanstone. Much, um, Mr. President. I thank Senator Ferris for, for the question. It's a question that I'm sure um, all women in this place would be interested in the answer to, but I strongly believe that probably every parliamentarian uh, will be interested in this response. I make the point that it is International Women's Day on Saturday, and normally we might take the opportunity to uh, just remember and remind ourselves that how much more secure Australian women now are. They've got more opportunities for jobs, better educational opportunities, more money in their pocket, uh, lower interest rates, more secure in their housing. And you know, I could take about 50 questions on that. But it is time to reflect, to reflect not only on the good position we're in, but the difficult position other people are in. 
Women have suffered terribly in the last decade when the international community and the United Nations failed to do what they should have done in Bosnia and failed to do what they should have done in Rwanda. And now we face a very similar choice. According to the US State Department, uh, Iraq has one of the worst human rights records of any nation. And for those people, for people who might not like to listen to the US uh, State Department, Order. Uh, <coughs> this, this view is shared by Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. There isn't a disagreement about this. And women are not immune from this shocking abuse. And while we have people protesting about a possible war with Iraq, it pays for us to reflect on the nature of the re regime that these protesters provide succour for. The United States State Department has reported the regime has a dedicated technical operations directorate that uses rape and sexual assault in a systematic way for political purposes. This unit has videotaped the rape of female relatives of suspected opposition figures for the purpose of blackmail to ensure future cooperation. The British government uh, <coughs> says that uh, Harvard University have identified a professional rapist by an Iraqi uh, government personnel card showing the person as a fighter in the popular army whose activity is violation of women's honour. In Iraqi prisons, women are routinely raped by their guards. Amnesty International has indicated that dozens of women accused of prostitution were beheaded without any judicial process. Not without proper process, without any process. <coughs> Mothers of Iraqi defectors have also been known to have been tortured to death for their children's activities. And that bears repeating. Mothers of Iraqi defectors have also been known to have been tortured to death for their children's activities. In 1990, Iraq passed a decree that allows male relatives to kill a female relative in the name of honour without any punishment. Now, I see Senator Balkis, I see Senator Balkis Mr. President, interjecting and smiling. I don't know what he thinks of this, but the rest of us think it's dreadful. Point of order. Senator Balkis. I'm not smiling. The point I was making across the chamber was that Senator Vanstone is talking about 1990. It's taken her 13 years to wake up to this when a lot of other people have been aware of it. Senator, you are a fraud. Uh, I believe he should withdraw that remark. Well, if you demand, I will. Well, I am. And also, you admitted it to interjecting across the chamber, and I, as you know, interjections are disorderly. But, Minister, could you continue with your answer? Yes. Uh, who who, Point who of order. saw? Order. Point of order. Senator Vanstone started describing actions and ascribing motives to Senator Balkus, which may or may not have been true. And I, I think that's an increasing tendency at question time for ministers to say, look at so and so, he's laughing at this answer when they may not be. And I believe that's disorderly as well, Mr President. Yeah, I take that point, Senator. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. F for those who saw the shocking pictures of gassed Kurdish women and children, when Saddam Hussein used weapons of mass destruction against his own people, those pictures should be indelibly printed on their minds. And I cannot understand, uh, Mr. President, and this government cannot understand people who can say, having waited as long as everyone's waited, having tried appeasement, having tried more talking from 1990 onwards, uh, that still say, uh, give it another go. Now, despite all this, uh, Mr. President. Uh, we still have people, some of them in place, defending this regime uh, to defy the United Nations and allowing them to get away with keeping their weapons of mass destruction in complete defiance of the National Se Security Council. In the words of one Iraqi woman, Nidal Sheikh Shalal, she said, "The Iraqi Order, woman." Minister, your time's expired. Senator, Mar Senator Ferris. I have a supplementary, Mr. President. I'd like to hear the minister conclude the quote that she was just making from the Iraqi woman, if she could please, as a supplementary. Well, I, um, I, I don't doubt whether that was a supplementary question. Um, it's to the fact that Senator Vanstone had not completed that aspect of the question I had asked her, and I would like to ask her to, to clarify and continue. Senator Faulkner. In point of order, Mr. President, you doubt it was a supplementary. I'm certain it wasn't. 
And I think you're quite right to have ruled it out of order. Can we move on with the next question? Well, that's not it. Senator Marshall. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Hill, the Minister for Defence. Would the Minister inform the Senate exactly how many defence personnel deployed to the Gulf have been returned to Australia because they refused to consent to the course of anthrax vaccines? Would the Minister also confirm that the government only told crew they would be returned if they refused the inoculation after the 25 who initially refused on the Canimbla had reduced to a number low enough to allow the ship to remain operational? Will the minister admit that the government, in fact, only told personnel of its change policy to return everyone who refused inoculation on the 7th of February, three days after the inoculations began? Doesn't this show that the policy of returning those who refused the vaccines was only implemented after the government could be sure that the numbers returned would not jeopardise the deployment? Minister for Defence, Senator Hill. Um, in relation to, to numbers, uh, Mr. President, um, uh, I, um, I recall that the, uh, that the Chief of the Defence Force said in the Estimates Committee that he would prefer not to give a running commentary on numbers whilst the, whilst the uh, inoculation process was taking place. Uh, that, is, that is still continuing, of course. There are three injections within each inoculation. Uh, and, but undertook to give the numbers at the completion of that process. Uh, and on reflection, I think that that is a sound way to address this matter. In relation to the, in relation to the so-called change of, change of policy, uh, there was in fact, uh, there was in fact no change of policy. Uh, the the order was given by the chief of the defence force. Uh, and, it, uh, and it wasn't changed at any time. Supplementary question, Senator Marshall. Yes, uh, Minister, how many personnel have now submitted a formal grievance about this process? And will the ADF be conducting an investigation into the inoculation process, in particular, why what personnel were told about the consequences of refusing inoculation changed between the 6th and 7th of February? Minister. Well, I've just said that the, there, was no, uh, there was no change in policy on this particular matter. The order, uh, the order was given that those who were going to the Middle East area of operations need to be inoculated against uh, anthrax, and that was uh, issued pursuant to a determination, a policy position in relation to voluntary inoculations, which was made in the year 2000. So there's no, been no change of policy in relation to this matter. Uh, Senator Heffernan. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Fisheries, Forestry and Conservation, Senator Ian MacDonald. Will the Minister outline what impact the recently announced New South Wales Labor Forest Policy will have on timber communities and on the regional forest agreement in that state? Very important. The Minister, Senator Ian MacDonald. Uh, Mr President, I, I thank Senator Heffernan for that question, and I know he has a genuine interest in the workers uh, in the uh, northeast forest areas that are, will be greatly affected by uh, this decision of the Labor government. And just for the benefit of the Senate, I'll, I'll rec recapitulate. Uh, the last Sunday, uh, Premier Carr announced that he would be removing some 65,000 hectares from production forests, and he would be locking them up in 15 new national parks state conservation areas or state forest reserves. Now, these areas Mr. President, are currently within the RFAs that the Commonwealth Government has signed with the New South Wales Government. There has been no consultation uh, with the Commonwealth Government at all, and this is in breach of at least the spirit of the regional forest agreements. Now, Mr. President, uh, Premier Carr signed these agreements himself personally with the Prime Minister uh, less than three years ago in March of 2000. Industry sources tell me, Mr President, that the New South Wales Labor government is already struggling to fulfil its existing supply commitments and is currently spending something like $65,000 each week just trucking logs from the south of the state up in the north to the north of the state to try and meet uh, the government's RFA uh, commitments. Uh, Premier Carr has said, uh, trying to appease the workers uh, in the North East, uh, that he will be offsetting the impact of locking up these areas by opening up buffer zones for logging. 
Well, unfortunately, Mr. President, those buffer zones are already included in the calculations of the uh, timber required. Industry have told me and have publicly said that as a result of this decision, some 1,400 jobs will be lost. Uh, in the northeast of New South Wales. These are jobs of workers, people in the smaller regional and rural communities uh, up in the uh, northeast of New South Wales. Now, obviously, on the eve of an election, Mr Carr is desperate to get preferences from anyone, even from a group of people who would boil the brains of our young people by giving away free uh, hard drugs like uh, ecstasy. But Mr Carr is determined to try and get preferences from people uh, like that by giving away the jobs of workers in uh, country towns in New South Wales. And where is country Labor at this time? Have we heard any objection from country Labor about um, these sort of uh, proposals? Now, Mr President, the worst part of this all is that it shows that Mr Carr cannot be believed. His word cannot be taken. It wasn't three years ago that he signed a solemn agreement with the Prime Minister to honour these RFAs. And on the eve of an election, he has broken his agreement uh, without any compunction whatsoever. We've heard rumours of these uh, uh, national parks uh, being put into production areas for some time. And I've written to the New South Wales government on many occasions demanding to know that they would not breach the RFA. And I've had assurances in writing, uh, uh, which I have here, Mr. Uh, President, from the New South Wales government, from Mr. Ref Shorgi, saying we will not be doing this. We will not be breaching the RFA, and it is not worth the paper it's written on. And that's the trouble. That is the real uh, tragedy of this, Mr. President. That Premier Carr's word cannot be believed. And if you can't believe him in relation to regional forest agreements, what can you believe him about? Any promise he might make in this uh, election should be subjected to the same sort of scrutiny. You can't believe him here. Why would you believe him on anything? Now, I feel sorry for the Labor Party opposite because they support regional forest agreements and they voted with us on it. And yet your state premier is breaching Minister, these agreements, putting at risk um, the jobs of workers Senator that McDonald, you guys are order. supposed to be looking after. Senator Macdonald, I'd remind you uh, to uh, your answer starts to be through the chair, not across the chamber. Senator Conroy. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Coonan, the Minister for Revenue and Assistant Treasurer. Does the minister recall her response to a question in the Senate? about Qantas' plans to surcharge customers who use credit cards when she replied, Qantas have not introduced it. I don't think they will. The government would certainly not be sympathetic to Qantas, particularly on routes where there is little competition. Is the minister aware that Qantas has since confirmed that they will introduce a surcharge on credit card customers from July 1, 2003? What action will the government take in response to Qantas', Qantas defiance? Is this just another case of the Assistant Treasurer misleading the Senate, or was her answer yesterday just sheer incompetence? The Assistant Treasurer, Senator Kernan. Uh, thank you for uh, the question, Senator Conroy. Um, the issue uh, to do with uh, credit uh, card interchange fees has been the subject of a couple of questions this week. And, uh, Yesterday, in respect of Qantas, uh, as I've already said, I was sure that Qantas is mindful of the consumer reactions that they've already had in relation to media uh, suggestions that they intended to introduce a credit card uh, surcharge. And yesterday, I said that Qantas had not introduced surcharging of credit card customers. That is correct. Now, if Qantas do decide to go ahead with surcharging, with surcharging customers on the 1st of July 2003, if they do, then that is clearly a commercial matter for them and not something that the government would either be vetting or approving. The Treasurer has already made some public statements in respect of this matter in relation to credit card reforms and uh, has expressed uh, his view that it would be preferable if the elements of the RBA's reforms were implement, implemented simultaneously. However, under this government's reforms, 
The RBA is independent, of course, in its decision making, and uh, the Labor Party, of course, supported uh, the RBA's reforms. Nevertheless, the government is entitled uh, to place its views on the public record and to communicate those views to interested parties. Uh, I understand uh, that Qantas was a recipient of, uh, of this advice and subsequently determined that its credit card surcharging would be delayed uh, until at least the 1st of July, when the RBA's reforms to interchange fees in fact commence operation. At the end of the day, uh, Mr President, uh, what is really clear about this matter is that these reforms are simply designed to ensure that customers are provided with much clearer market signals that credit cards are a more expensive means of payment. They clearly are. Uh, and this might come as a surprise to those opposite, but we do, of course, live in a market economy, and the government is not in the business either with credit cards or other fees and charges of setting the level of charges that companies can impose on customers for different payment methods. Ultimately, it is increased competition that will reduce the cost to merchants of uh, making these services available to their customers. Increased competition should also put downward pressure on uh, credit card fees and interest rates for consumers. Uh, we should remember that making isolated change in pricing structures before the RBA reforms has commenced is hardly evidence that the reforms are not flowing through to consumers. Consumer preferences for differing payment methods do not change overnight, but over time competitive pressures, of course, will deliver significant benefits uh, to consumers. The, uh, the point about, uh, about credit card charges is that these reforms are just in their first stage. And uh, it is clear under the circumstances that it is preferable that if, in fact, surcharges to be introduced by any company, that it be done, uh, done as a response and done all at the same time. A very good act. Senator Conroy. Complimentary, Mr President. The, the minister very selectively quoted uh, her statement. She said, Qantas have not introduced it and then stopped because she went on to say, I don't think they will. The government would certainly not be sympathetic to Qantas. Now you're washing your hands. In light of the government's continued inaction to ensure savings from credit card reforms that reach consumers, will the minister explain exactly what agency is responsible for ensuring they do? Is the minister aware the RBA has stated that it does not have responsibility for monitoring prices charged to customers, ASIC has no power to take action over surcharging, and the Treasurer has failed to grant the ACCC surveillance powers over credit card reforms. Minister, exactly who is going to protect consumers from this monopoly rip-off? The Minister, Senator Coonan. Are you Senator Abetz? Uh, Mr President, an allegation was made uh, against the minister that she had misled the Senate, and I believe that that ought to be withdrawn. Yeah. Senator Coonan, I didn't say across the chamber, which was disorderly and could have been called to order, just like all the other interjections. I didn't say, why did you deliberately mislead the Senate? I said, why did, why did you mislead the Senate? It's not, dis it's not out of order. But Sen Senator Abetz should know that, but of course he doesn't really understand what happens in this place. Well, it's still a very good question why she misled the Senate. There, there's no point of order, but uh, I'll listen carefully to any future interjections along that line. Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, there is uh, there is certainly no suggestion that uh, I've misled the Senate. What is in fact misleading? Exactly. What is in fact misleading is that the uh, is that the Labor Party doesn't doesn't understand credit card Order. reform. The Labor Party doesn't understand credit card reform. They supported it, and now they don't understand the implementation stages that are required to actually get these reforms in place. They don't understand an orderly way in which it's proceeding, and they certainly don't understand the surveillance powers of ASIC 
or the ACCC. The, uh, it's an interesting point that uh, Senator Conroy stands up and talks about invoking the ACCC's powers. And what we know is, of course, that every Labor government, at least four of them, uh, in this country are now opposing the appointment of a chairman to the ACCC. They are opposing, they're opposing an outstanding Order. candidate being appointed chairman the of the ACCC. Minister, your time's expired. Senator Allison. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Um, is the minister aware that the executive director of the Society of Hospital Pharmacists says the shortage of hospital pharmacists will soon reach crisis point? Is the minister aware that the New South Wales Health Department says there is a serious shortage of physiotherapists, podiatrists and radiographers in public hospitals around the country? What is the minister doing to address uh, the serious shortages in the availability of, the health, of health workers in this country and, uh, as a result, uh, health workers in our public hospital system? Order. Before I call the minister, Senator Kemp and Senator Ray, it's difficult enough to hear Senator Allison at the other end of the chamber without interjections across the chamber. So I'd ask you to come to order. Senator Patterson. Senator Kemp, Senator Kemp, I did call you to order. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Sen Senator Allison has asked me quite a complex question about workforce issues, some of which actually pertains to the Minister for Education, some of which pertains to the responsibility of the states, and some an area within my responsibility. Not actually have to say a whole lot under, in my area of responsibility. But one of the issues that we need to look at is that young people who undertake allied health professional training are highly mobile. They're very much in demand overseas. They're very much in demand also outside their own workforce area, their originally dedicated workforce area, because of their particular knowledge in health. So despite the fact that you might train X number of physiotherapists, X number of podiatrists, orthoptists or whatever, you can't always guarantee that they're going to end up uh, working in that allied health professional area. And workforce issues and having worked in the area of allied health professional training for 11 years before coming into this place, workforce issue predictions are very difficult, particularly in the health area because of the high mobility uh, with, across, uh, throughout the world and also across into other professions. In, uh, the, uh, during the life of the, last current, uh, of life of the current health care agreements, we increased funding to the states for public hospitals by 6 per cent in real terms. The states increased their contribution by less than CPI, so their contribution didn't go up. Now, one of the things that actually keeps went down in terms of real ter in real terms, one of the things that keeps uh, people in that profession is salaries, and I, I'm not responsible for, for uh, allied health professional salaries. And so it's important to understand that the very difficult issue of workforce, of workforce in allied health, is, as I said, a combination of the responsibility of the states and the universities in providing sufficient places in universities. And one of the other factors is that the hospitals then, the states have to then produce sufficient number of clinical placements for those students. There's no point the universities increasing their numbers of physiotherapists, for example, if the states don't offer clinical placements for them. So the states therefore have to offer sufficient clinical placements to enable those students to undertake their training, all of which requires clinical uh, years or at least clinical rotations. So the states require, are required to do that. And there's been some problems in actually getting those numbers and getting those numbers up. So it is a responsibility basically of the states if, in, in attracting them in salaries. One of the areas where it's our responsibility is, is in uh, education, where we can do something about it. And we have, for example, with the shortage of medical physicists and medical radiologists, is to actually, um, for, medical, for radiologists, to increase uh, funding to enable uh, an intake, an extra intake of, I think it's, I can't remember the exact number, I won't quote the number, but to, to, uh, last year and, and next, this year and next year to increase that uh, workforce. So we have stepped in. Uh, in some cases, but it is up to the university to determine. And I was talking to a university, uh, to someone today from one of the medical schools, medical and health science schools, where they've taken some of their hex places and reproduced them and turned them into nursing hex places. Now, there are a lot of flexibilities, and also the states have a responsibility. So it is a combined responsibility, but it is very difficult to actually keep and maintain those people also because of their high mobility. 
Senator Allison. Then supplementary question, if I may. Um, I thank the minister for her answer, but ask: Is it not a fundamental national issue to understand uh, uh, the workforce for our public hospitals, in particular? And is it not the responsibility of your department to do this work? And uh, can I also ask? Uh, the minister says that uh, that allied health professionals have a high mobility, but what analysis has the minister done uh, of the uh, government's? private health insurance rebate uh, in terms of the likelihood that this is the mechanism that is robbing public hospitals of their workforce? The Minister, Senator Patterson. Well, Mr President, Senator Allison makes an assumption. I don't believe she's right. And also, uh, when she says, uh, when I reiterate what I said before, that it is a combined responsibility, but the responsibility lies more heavily with the states. Than it does, and if the states had actually increased their funding during the life of the last agreement, rather than not even keeping up with CPI, they may have been in a position to attract more allied health professionals into their public hospitals. Senator Moore. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to Senator Coonan, Assistant Treasurer and Minister for Revenue. I refer to the Reserve Bank's stated intention to impose an access regime to open up the credit card market to new players as a way of putting downward pressure on interest rates on credit cards. What priority does the government put on this initiative to improve competition and to protect consumers? What action has the minister undertaken to put this regime into practice? The Assistant Treasurer, Senator Coonan. Uh, well, uh, thank you for the question. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I should say at the outset that it's actually not my portfolio or my place to be putting anything uh, in place in relation to credit card fees, but, however, I do answer questions in this place about uh, credit card fees and, I'm, and uh, credit card uh, reforms, and I'm very, happy, I'm very happy to answer Senator Moore's question. That is, if anyone over there wants to, uh, wants to listen. Uh, Senator Moore's asked a question, and uh, she's presumably entitled to, entitled to have an answer. The um, RBA's reform of uh, credit cards, which uh, Senator Moore's uh, uh, party supported, uh, released on the 27th of August last year, aims to ensure that uh, the cost of credit cards will no longer be borne disproportionately by credit card uh, uh, holders who use the revolving line of credit, uh, merchants that accept credit cards for payment and the community as a whole including consumers who do not use credit cards. So the introduction of a transparent and cost-based system for setting interchange fees is expected to reduce the average level of these fees by nearly 40 per cent. The reforms are expected to reduce the total cost of providing the credit card payment system by around a billion dollars per annum within the next five years. Consumers should benefit from these reforms through a reduction in the general level of prices for goods and services, increased competition between financial institutions in processing credit card transactions should reduce also the cost to merchants of making these services available to their customers. Increased competition should also put downward pressure on credit card fees and interest rates for consumers. The Australian Prudential Regulation Authority will oversee the approval and supervision of new credit card providers to ensure that the reforms don't actually threaten the stability of the payment system. Allowing uh, merchants to surcharge provides customers with clearer market signals. Certainly, uh, that was what I said in my previous answer as well, that credit cards are a more expensive means of payment. The option to surcharge will give merchants greater leverage to negotiate the mer merchant service fee with uh, the banks that process their transactions. The majority of businesses have chosen not to surcharge. Uh, customers are aware of new arrangements and they're preparing to consider alternative payment options or shop around between different providers, which is the purpose. The RBA's decision to delay the imposition of the reduced interchange fee until after the introduction of the new surcharge rules was intended to provide an incentive for banks to reduce the intercharge fees. 
the government would like businesses that choose to surcharge to provide consumers with time to prepare for such uh, changes. This is in line with discussions held with banks about ensuring that their customers are given advance notice of changes in account conditions. So, uh, uh, in answer to Senator Moore, it is a, a most comprehensive uh, reform process for credit card uh, for, for the whole credit card order. regime Senator that has Kernan, been supported. Point of order has been taken by Senator Conroy. Yes. Point, my point of order is, is relevance. The question referred to the access regime to open up the credit card market. The minister has just read the wrong brief for the second day running. I was just ask, wondering if you could ask her to come back to the question that was asked about the access well, regime. I think the minister has concluded her answer, and I'm sure she's going to get a supplementary answer. Question, Senator Moore. To Mr. President, given that the actual access um, regime was part of an important part of the government's so-called suite of credit card reforms. Can the minister inform the Senate why, more than six months after the RBA's announcement, this actual new regime—and I couldn't quite get the answer—has not yet commenced? Um, when will the government take all the necessary steps to implement the suite of reforms? Senator Kernan. Uh, <laughs> Order. <laughs> Senators on my, Senator Kemp. Senator Kemp, Senator Kemp, I have to call you to order again. Your colleague is trying to answer a question. Senator Kernan. Senator Kernan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I've explained over the past two days, this uh, uh, access regime and the whole of the credit card reforms is a staged process. This is the very first part of the reform process that's in part. And uh, the, uh, it's a reform that has been uh, put forward by the RBA and supported by the Labor Party. <sighs> Senator Harradeen. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Communications, IT and the Arts. Uh, has the Minister uh, seen the latest uh, Australian Institute survey issued yesterday? which showed that 93 per cent of parents would support automatic filtering of internet pornography to help protect their teenagers from porn merchant predators. Would the minister consider requiring Telstra, as the largest importer of data, to filter out internet pornography, much of which contains images of sexual degradation and even rape. How much extra money does Telstra earn each year from selling bandwidth with, uh, to import pornography? The Minister for Communication, Senator Alston. Uh, Mr President, I am aware that um, that was one of the findings from that report, that 93 per cent of parents uh, would welcome the opportunity to uh, have uh, offensive or even illegal material uh, excluded by way of uh, filtering technologies. Uh, it's not clear, however, from the report, and I think I have to say once again that uh, it was a sample of only 200. Uh, it's not entirely out of line with other research, particularly out of the US, so um, I don't think we should um, uh, dismiss it for that reason, but um, one just has to be a bit careful. But I think. Um, a response of that nature does not, of course, uh, involve any assessment of the uh, technical implications of um, how you might limit access. Now, I, that's why I think it's very important that we do properly explore these issues and to see what is technologically possible, not take the sort of lazy Senator Lundy approach that it's all too hard, that education is the only answer, you know, the, the classic sort of it, don't, don't even bother. Don't even bother to look at how technology operates, how it's improved, what sort of new techniques are available. Uh, I mean, Senator Lundy was out there a few years ago, ha happy to support the proposition that we were global village idiots. Do you remember that one? Global village idiots we were because because we introduced an internet content regulation regime. All right, and uh, no need to boast, Senator Conroy. Uh, but in fact. 
in, in fact, of course, we now have the Internet Industry Association saying that we are world's best practice. Now, you can't have it both ways. Uh, well, if you've got a problem, you talk to Senator Connolly, all right? Senator Heffernan. Uh, so, Mr. President, um, we certainly uh, want, want to uh, give proper consideration to all of the uh, possibilities and certainly not just uh, take an industry sympathetic line on these things, but also, of course, you have to have regard to uh, what the consequences of that approach might be. And I did indicate yesterday that uh, an approach that involved uh, software filters being uh, required to be made available in the first instance on an opt-out basis rather than an opt-in basis may well be a much more effective way of ensuring that these matters are brought to the attention of internet users. What are you a bit worried about? Uh, you see, uh, it's not good enough to simply say, well, we'll tell parents about it. Parents often have no idea how to go about doing something about the problem. They might be aware of, of it, but uh, if, if, you want any help, if you want any help from me to protect you from Senator Conroy, I'm happy to do it. I thought it was an appalling attack the other day. Uh, I can understand his frustration, but uh, then again he did get rolled, so uh, one has to be tolerant. Uh, Mr President, I think it's also a bit unfair to be uh, Telstra-focused. Senator Harradine's proposition was essentially should Telstra bear the burden of filtering out offensive or illegal material. Now, I think uh, it's much better to have a solution that focuses on the obligations of both carriers and carriage service providers that uh, then imposes obligations across the industry. And that's the approach we'll be taking. Carriers, uh, in many instances, aren't even aware of the material that they do carry because they are common carriers. Uh, and therefore, of course, one can't quantify uh, the value of any material that might be transmitted. But it is fair to say that they are uh, commercial beneficiaries and to that extent they have a vested interest and we have to take that into account as well. So uh, I simply say to Senator Harradine, I think his concerns are very well placed and uh, we do have an obligation to take them seriously. The tragedy, of course, is only Order. half the parliament's interest in the Order, Minister. Your time's expired. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Patterson, Minister for Health and Ageing. Can the minister confirm that one of the first actions in health policy by the incoming Howard government in 1996 was to introduce mandatory postgraduate training requirements for GPs, for which there was a limit of only 400 training places every year? Can the minister recall that the effect of this decision was to directly restrict the number of G GPs to enter practice? Isn't it the case that, that the that that the government's own policies have contributed to workforce shortages, which are making it harder and harder for Australians to find a doctor, let alone a bulk billing doctor. The Minister for Health, Senator Patterson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, when we came into government, we had far too few doctors in, in rural areas and out of metropolitan areas, and far too many in in uh, sorry, far too few in uh, rural and out of metropolitan areas, and too many in the city areas and they were maldistributed. AMWAC, the Australian Medical Workforce Advisory Committee, had been advising both governments of both persuasions, uh, the Labor Party when they were in government and us, that we had sufficient doctors. It was an issue of di distribution. Now, the, uh, the uh, uh, Australian Medical Workforce Advisory Committee has indicated recently that we need an increase in the number of trainee doctors. And of course, I've been listening carefully to what they have to say. And uh, one of the areas where there's been the most strain immediately has been on the public hospitals. Now, in response to that, and as I said, you can't, I've said a number of times, you can't actually make doctors overnight. They take a long while to train. I did actually suggest to the department that we might look at using young people from, uh, from overseas who pay to do their medical course here in Australia. And when the health ministers and, uh, and I talked about this workforce issue, I responded. I had enormous cooperation from Mr Ruddock, and in, in a matter of only a few weeks we changed the regulations and those students were able to stay when they graduated and work in our first class teaching, public teaching hospitals. We have uh, forgotten the exact number that we now have, but a significant number of young doctors, more than some whole medical school outputs, which is actually affected the, uh, the number of, of uh, doctors available 
and reduce the strain on those, those young people. Now, Senator McLucas goes on and says, does uh, restricting the number of GP trainees contribute to the uh, problem with, with, with uh, the number of general practitioners? One of the major issues about the, about the issue of workforce is that we have them maldistributed. And we've had incentives in place and requirements when those people undertake their specialist training programs that they go into rural areas and if they're doing their training in a city area, it's been, I think it's six months, but it's been a period of time out in a rural area. And uh, to try and actually correct this maldistribution, and we're seeing all those programs we've put in place now find an 11.7, I think it is, but over 11 per cent increase in full time, est estimated full time doctors in rural areas. A 4.7 per cent increase last year alone in, in, into rural areas. Now, also, when Labor was in, in, in government, we had a training program which was basically located in the cities. And young people who wanted to train as a, 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 in, and up, to, up to school in general practice had to get their a fellowship with the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, mainly, not always, but mainly had to come into the city or have some contact or be near a provider. We now have, through GPET, a program which now delivers that training program uh, a company which has been set up to deliver that program to, to standards set by the RACGP right round Australia. And I had the absolute privilege of being in Bendigo on Friday to meet with a group of those people running those programs. Doctors dedicated, giving enormous amounts of voluntary time to actually train and develop young doctors in training with them in their practices to, right on the spot not having to travel miles, being able to go to a training program in Mildura or in Bendigo or in Ballarat, rather than going to tr what they used to have to do is to go to Trawalla down in town in, in the middle of, of Melbourne. It's been sold now, but now they are able to now train in location. So I, I don't think Senator McLucas uh, can actually have a leg to stand on in terms of what Labor's record was. We had doctors who were maldistributed. They were too many in the, in the city, too few in the country, Order, and we've Minister, been correcting that. Your time's expired. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr President. How does the minister explain the Health Department's own December 2001 warning at, obtained by the Australian newspaper through FOI, confirming that the decision of the Howard government in 1996 to limit training places for GPs has contributed to the shortage of GPs throughout Australia? How then can the minister continue to claim in this place that the GP shortage is not of this government's making. It has now been seven years, Minister. When will the Minister start taking some responsibility for the doctor shortage and the effect that the shortage is having on bulk billing rates? Minister for Health. Mr President, well, Labor did nothing to, about the maldistribution of general practitioners. Absolutely. Absolutely nothing. They did nothing to help young GPs in training receive their training in rural areas. No wonder they wouldn't go to rural areas. They did nothing to give them incentives, as we have done a $10,000, a $20,000, $10,000 the first year, $20,000 the second year, $30,000 the third year, if they do, do their GP training in a rural area, and hex relief for each of those years, and hex relief if they do their training in, uh, in rural hospitals. To, for the people on the other side to comment, or even deign to comment, about about GP numbers and about what happens to GPs and where they are is very rich when they did nothing to actually correct the maldistribution of doctors, which is one of the factors which affects bulk billing. Senator Johnston. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Arts and Sport, Senator Kemp. Will the Minister update the Senate? Order. Senator, Senator Johnston. Will the minister update the Senate on developments concerning the government's tough stand on drugs in sport? The Minister for Sport and Tourism, Senator Kemp. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and uh, thank you to Senator Johnson. I might say, Mr President, it was very hard to hear the question because of the noise coming from the other side, but, Senator, if I haven't covered all the issues that you've raised, uh, come back with a supplementary. Uh, Mr President, uh, can I, I can report to the Senate that uh, an historic conference uh, to tackle uh, the issue of drugs in sport uh, has just concluded in uh, Copenhagen. Over, Order. over one, over 1,000 representatives uh, from more than 80 countries uh, uh,
went to the conference, uh, Mr. President, and, uh, it was, and the major sporting bodies as well. The conference uh, was a very important and significant event, and its aim uh, was twofold. Uh, first, uh, to consider the adoption of an anti-doping uh, code, and secondly, to consider a declaration uh, to be signed by governments and public authorities that formally recognises uh, and supports uh, the code. So it was a very important uh, conference, uh, Mr. President. Uh, and I'm pleased to announce that uh, last night, uh, at the final session of the conference, uh, all major sporting federations and nearly 80 governments uh, gave their approval to the World Anti-Doping Code uh, by backing a resolution. In addition, 50 countries. In addition, this is uh, interesting. This will be of interest to you, particularly Senator Lundy. It will be of interest. In, in addition, uh, 50 countries, including Australia, signed uh, the declaration on doping in sport. Uh, which commits uh, governments to uh, supporting the code. Another 23 governments uh, present at the conference uh, said that they would sign at a later date. As I have said, uh, Mr. President, uh, this is an historic moment uh, for sport and uh, a noteworthy event, of course, for sport in Australia. For the first time, uh, we are establishing an effective international anti-doping regime in sport. And that has been achieved through the cooperation between governments and the international sporting community. Of course, global endorsement of the code uh, in itself is not enough to stamp out drugs. As the IOC president, uh, Jacques Rogge, uh, said of the code yesterday, and I quote, uh, this, is, uh, this is a means to an end. We, we can't bask in the glory of this conference. What I'm interested in is, in is how to uh, diminish uh, doping. This code is a order, major tool order, order in Minister, that process. Senators on my left, there's too much noise across the chamber, and you know it's disorderly. There are there are a few Minister, dates, uh, there, Mr. President. Yeah. I can assure you of that. Uh, Minister, well, I'd and, appreciate and, it if you'd make your remarks through the chair. And Mr. President, uh, Jack Rogg is uh, quite correct. To ensure Australia remains at the uh, leading edge of the fight against drugs in sport and is uh, consistent with the uh, code, I announced a review of the government's uh, tough on drugs in sport strategy last September. And at that time, I also announced that a review would include an evaluation of the merits of, uh, of establishing an independent tribunal to conduct hearings into uh, doping violations. At present, uh, the handling of positive uh, test results is in the hands of individual sports. And one of the lessons uh, we have learnt is that this uh, can result in a degree of in inconsistency in outcomes. We must also ensure fairness and natural justice for athletes uh, through appropriate hearing and appeal processes. Mr President, uh, I think Australia can take uh, great pride in the leading role it has uh, played in the development of uh, the anti-doping code. Not only were we one of the first nations uh, to take a strong domestic stand on drugs in sport, we were one of the first to urge an international approach uh, to this issue. This government uh, is strongly committed to the fight against uh, drug use in sport. It wants to achieve a sporting environment free from uh, drug cheats, in which, uh, which uh, our sportsmen and our sportswomen Order, are Minister. able to compete fairly. Minister, your time's expired. Senator Johnston. Thank you, Thank you Mr. President. I have a supplementary for the minister. Could he further elaborate on Australia's participation in the World Anti-Doping Code and further elaborate on Australia's anti-doping regime? Here, here. Senator Kemp. Again, uh, Senator Johnson, for that important question. The point I was making is that Australia has taken a, the, the, a very strong lead in this process, uh, and I think even um, Senator Lundy, uh, in her wiser moments, would, uh, would uh, concede that. Uh, it was Australia, of course, before the Sydney Olympics, uh, Mr. President, uh, that I think uh, was very effective at, uh, at bringing to uh, the attention of uh, the international sporting community the need that uh, we had to take a, a firm and tough action on drugs in sport. And uh, the public expect uh, no less, uh, in our view, that uh, sport. We must do everything possible to keep sport uh, free of drugs. And uh, one of the, the why I described as an historic moment is that uh, now the international community now has uh, added, uh, an anti-doping code, which uh, all countries will eventually sign up to. And this and this will be applied, and this will ensure that uh, we can have a good chance of uh, ridding the uh, sport of the scourge of drugs 
Uh, and that is Minister. why we're, in Australia is very strongly supported with this case. Yeah. Senator, Senator Stevens. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing, Senator Patterson. Can the Minister confirm that despite population growth, Australians visited their GPs 1.75 million fewer times in 2002 than in the previous year, and that for the first time since 1995, the number of GP visits in a calendar year has dropped below 100 million. Is the minister concerned that people are now choosing not to go to the doctor rather than pay a hefty co-payment? The order. Senators on, my, senators on my right, Senator Ralston, I would like to hear the minister's answer in, in silence. I don't enjoy answering this question. Senator Patterson. Because somebody on the other side, and I can't remember who it was, last year came out with a document that said if you spend more money on pharmaceutical benefits, then people won't need to go to the doctor as often. And guess what we did last year? We spent a lot more on pharmaceutical benefits. And that was what they were arguing. If you spend more money, and they got over there and argued, that despite the fact that the paper was written and commissioned by a drug company, they didn't know that at the time. When I told them, they backpedalled 100 miles an hour. So they came in, used a bit of evidence, and said, look at this. If we spend more money, on, on uh, pharmaceuticals, we will have people going to the doctor less often. Well, you know what's happened? We've spent more money on pharmaceuticals, and maybe they should look at who publishes the papers before they bring them in. But anyway, that was one of the examples. The other thing is that when Labor was in government, when we have two sorts of funding for short consultations and long consultations, and when somebody goes for a short consultation, uh, they, get, they get a higher rebate than they did under Labor. We've increased it for short consultation, standard consultation, by 20 per cent over the time we've been in government. Labor increased it by 9 per cent in the last six years they are in. So we pay doctors more for short consultation. And with regard to long consultations, where we have increased it by 23 per cent and they increased it by only 5 per cent. Now remember that in that period when they are in government, we are in a period of high inflation. And we are now in a period of low inflation, so the increase is greater because of low inflation. Doctors, people now go and spend longer with a doctor and deal with their cases, their items. And all, we all know that when you go into the doctor, you're quite nervous, and you, and and if you feel that you're under pressure of time, you maybe don't tell the doctor about all the things that you need to speak to them about. But if you've got a long consultation, for which we now pay doctors significantly more than the Labor Party ever did, we, that we increased that, then you'd expect people to go to the doctor less often. In addition, because we're interested in health outcomes, because we're interested in people uh, managing their asthma, managing their diabetes, managing mental illness and depression, we actually have funded practice incentive programs by giving doctors increased payments, and it works out about $18,000 per year per doctor, to actually spend longer time with patients, to work through a management program with them, diet, people with diabetics, diabetes, people with asthma, to ensure that they don't have to go to the doctor as often and so they get better health outcomes. So the assumption on the other side is that people aren't going to the doctor for, because, because they have to pay. They don't look at all the other factors that are in place to actually increase the length of time people spend with doctors, both in a long consultation and also under the practice incentive programs where people are assisted in managing their illness and we hope have to go to the doctor less often. I would hope that we would see people going less and less often and be healthier. But let me just say, they said on the other side, if you, spe if you increase spending on pharmaceutical benefits, visits to doctors will go down and we have increased spending on pharmaceutical benefits for, by a significant amount by 10 per cent last year. Senator Order. Senator Stevens. Th uh, thank you, Mr President. A supplementary question to the minister, in, bearing in mind just what she had, uh, how she's just answered the previous question. Perhaps she can tell us if she is aware of a study published yesterday in the Journal of the Australian College for Emergency Medicine that found that half the children taken to hospital emergency departments have non-urgent complaints like colds and flu that in most cases would have been treated by a GP. 
When will the minister admit that the unavailability of bulk billing for Australian families, not just pensioners and the disadvantaged, is placing increasing pressure on the emergency departments of our public hospitals and is likely to have long-term public health consequences? Senator Patterson. The, um, with regard to visits to emergency departments, I might just remind the honourable senator on the other side that we have had an increased number of children with meningococcus both B and C, and parents who are very concerned when especially uh, want to go because they know how serious it is that the, that the child receive antibiotics very quickly, I think has, has actually increased the possibility of, of, uh, pay, of, of parents taking children to emergency departments. So I want to remind my colleagues on the other side that we now are vaccinating children across all cohorts, one to five. And the states are in fact vaccinating school-aged children in those two cohorts, and then in the next, in the following years, we hope to catch up the group in between. You know which state is the slowest and behind in doing that meningococcal vaccine and rolling it out amongst the school-aged students? New South New Wales. South Wales. New, South Wales. New South Wales. Senator. Ask further questions for that. Senator Hill. Senator Hill. Yeah. Are there any? Senator Patterson. Question to Senator Allison, and I talked about the number of radiotherapy students. Um, it was 57, and it was 57 uh, last year and 57 this year. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McLucas. Perhaps you might like to move that again. Your microphone doesn't appear to be working. Thank you, Mr. President. That's I move fair. that the Senate takes note of uh, answers to questions from uh, Senator Patterson today, mainly about the issue of uh, bulk billing. The decline in bulk billing rates uh, over the last six years, in particular, is the single most concerning uh, issue facing Australia's health system. Labor has been concerned for all of that time that bulk billing rates have been uh, have been falling. Just after this government came into office, we had bulk billing rates peak at a level of just over 80 per cent. And over the last, and over the last uh, six years, we have seen that rate fall in, in the last quarter to just under 70 per cent. That's a loss of 10 per cent uh, of uh, visitations to doctors are uh, bulk billed. We have continually to raise the, continued to raise this issue, this issue for good reason. We, are, we have been seeking uh, answers from the government as, as to what they're going to do uh, to stop the free fall in bulk billing rates. And as we all know, there have been very little. There has been no response uh, in a policy sense uh, to tell us what, uh, what the government intends to do. It's my view, Mr. Act Mr. Deputy President, that uh, in fact that's actually the strategy. That that. Uh, we would, the government's intention is to let bulk billing rates fall, uh, to let uh, the community become accustomed to paying uh, uh, the co-payment, so that when bulk billing was completely annihilated, uh, then we, we as a community would simply think that, uh, that it was normal to be paying a co-payment uh, to, uh, to, uh, to a general practitioner so that we wouldn't worry about uh, bulk billing and, and that uh, Mr Howard's desire that he expressed so clearly uh, to uh, get rid of Medicare, and that's a quote, uh, would in fact be achieved. But the other point I want to make today was just the extraordinary response from Senator Pat Patterson about um, the practice of incentive payments that were leading to these amazing health outcomes that as a direct rate, and the point was that then we had lower visitation rates uh, uh, to GPs in the year 2000, 2002. Now that sounds as if it could be quite a logical thing that if you had longer, longer consultations at a GP that you would have less need to go to one. That's the question I asked the minister and the department during the recent estimates. I asked the minister along the lines, what evidence do we have uh, that would support, uh, that, that would say that the practice in incentive schemes, the PIP payments, are in fact, are in fact uh, 
delivering greater health outcomes. The department was clear. They can't answer that question. It's too hard. You can't collect the data, so you can't answer that question. So for the minister to stand up here today and make some convoluted argument to say that that is the reason that we have improved health outcomes is not supported by data, and it's not supported by the data for, from her own department, and she has in fact reported that to the Senate Estimate Committee uh, last year. The other point that she made, which I think uh, was quite extraordinary, was that higher, higher expenditure in pharmaceuticals uh, in the year 2002 resulted in lower visitations to a GP. Now, I'd like to see the evidence that supports that statement. I'd like to see that evidence. There is no evidence that supports that statement, and the minister knows it. That's a, a complete, completely misleading, and, um, and, and it'll be interesting to see what the medical profession will make of such an extraordinary statement. Finally, Mr. Mr. Acting, Mr. Deputy President, I just want to uh, make some comments about the level of uh, bulk, billing uh, bulk billing rates in the seat of Herbert, which has completely plummeted uh, to a rate uh, uh, under 65 per cent, uh, sorry, under 56 per cent, to under 56 per cent. The minister has done nothing about uh, bulk billing rates in regional areas like th uh, the seat of Herbert, nothing at all. And uh, for, for the member for Herbert, Mr Lindsay, to be proclaiming uh, his victory to, proclaim, to be proclaiming a victory in receiving some after hours uh, 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 overseas trained uh, doctors to work in uh, after hours clinics is completely ridiculous because they will only be able to work as after hours doctors and not during the daytime. Your time has expired. Senator Knowles. Had a few copies of Hansard here. I'd be so bold as to move for the incorporation of the last ten speeches I've made on this subject, but um, unfortunately uh, I don't. So I suppose we just have to go through the motion again of setting the record straight on this particular subject about bulk billing. Now I just want to actually start talking again about where the Labor Party was on this particular issue. The Labor Party brought in Medicare. Now, let us not forget that. That's point number one. Dr Blewett used to be the health minister. Now, in 1987, Dr Blewett said this. We have, what we have mostly in this country is not doctors exploiting bulk billing, but compassionate doctors using the bulk billing facility to treat pensioners, the disadvantaged and others who are not well off or who are in great need of medical services, which was always the intention." Unquote. That's right, Senator Regleston. He was the health minister under Labor, and that is the principle under which Medicare was put in place by the Labor Party. Now, because Mr Crean's leadership is at an all-time rock-bottom low, and he doesn't know what to do about health, we start getting this furphy that it, bulk billings now, for some reason, under the Labor Party, got to be for everybody. It has never been for everybody, even under a Labor government. And only because Mr Crean's leadership is at huge risk and Mr Smith comes up with these harebrained ideas every Sunday and that Mr Smith is pushing the abolition of the 30 per cent rebate, and Mr Crean's saying, oh, not too sure about that sport, don't talk about that just yet, we're going to keep that as a little surprise, and Mr Smith's saying, oh no, we are going to ab abolish the 30 per cent rebate because it is unfair, we've now got this other little hair running, that somehow Medicare, re uh, Medicare bulk billing has to be for everybody. Well, goodness gracious me! It has never been for everybody. Under the Labor Party, it was never for anybody. Under us, it has never been for anybody. Ah, isn't it interesting? The Labor opposition interject and say it is meant to be universal. What is, uni what is universal is the facility for people to go to the doctor and everyone get the same rebate. That is the system you, the Labor government put in place. So that and to be able to go 
It is available. Oh. That's interesting, because no, at no stage has the Labor government ever said that there is not a service available. At least they haven't come to that bottom of the pit yet. Now, see, the interesting thing is they still don't understand. Dr Blewett said, as health minister who was part of the architect of the Labor government, that the universal bulk billing for everybody was, quote, always not, not the intention. Was not the intention. So why is it? Why is it now suddenly the intention of the Labor Party? Because Mr Crean's leadership is absolutely at rock bottom. Mr Smith has no idea what he's talking about. And clearly every Sunday when he comes up and says, oh gosh, it's a Sunday, I have to do a media interview today. I have to think of something else. We now have this running. Now, un unfortunately, the Labor Party record is appalling in health. Absolutely appalling. This is the opposition that, when in government, they ran down private health insurance from somewhere around 60 to 70 per cent to between 20 and 25 per cent. That's their record. Also, under the uh, Labor government, they ran down the Medicare rebate for a standard consultation. Since we have been in government, we've increased it 20 per cent. In the last six years of the Labor government, they increased it by 9 per cent. Now, that's hardly a record about which I would be proud if I was a Labor senator today. But do we hear them talk about that? No, we do not. And under the Labor government, the Medicare rebate for longer consultations, which Senator McLucas referred to a little while ago as not being important for some reason. I can't think for why, whatever reason, longer consultations wouldn't be important. But we've increased it by 23 per cent, the Labor Party 5 per cent. Your time has expired, Senator Knowles. Senator Moore. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, I also rise to speak on the answers provided by Senator Patterson and also to, at this stage, um, deeply thank Senator Knowles for reminding us that, in fact, it was Labor that introduced Medicare. It had slipped my mind, so it was, um, it's very useful to have that information. Um, in, the, in the answers that um, Minister Patterson gave today, in her first range of answers, she talked about the maldistribution of doctors across the country and inferred that, in fact, that meant that in terms of, re of um, city centres, that should be able to be reflected that in those areas there would be very strong numbers of bulk billing, high numbers of doctors available, and that people would have, in fact, no difficulty accessing bulk billing if you lived in non regional, non rural areas, because the basis of the argument was that maldistribution of doctors, and I, di I dislike that term intensely, but it was the one used by um, the minister, the maldistribution meant that bulk billing would only be a problem in regional or country areas. Well, in fact, that's not true. In the centre of Brisbane, which um, in my opinion is in fact a city area and a metropolitan area, in the seat of Ryan, in the seat of Ryan, which is the second most central seat in the city of Brisbane, Bulk billing has, in fact, um, I won't use the word plummeted, I think it has been overused, but it has actually fallen by over 20 per cent in the last two years. Now, in terms of finding a bulk billing doctor in the seat of Ryan, in the centre of Brisbane, with the alleged maldistribution of doctors, you are unable to find a doctor who bulk bills. This is, in fact, an area that has a very, very large student population, a very large um, group of people who are living in the centre of, city, of the city to access services. In this area, you cannot find a bulk billing doctor. However, I am concerned about the fact that bulk billing is a problem across the rest of the state. Um, I'm also concerned by the answers raised by the minister, who was talking about the fact that by spending more money on health care and pharmaceutical benefits and also raising the funding for long-term consultations, that in fact would aid the patients. It does. And it does. The tobacco programs do. However, the people who come to see us, the people who write into us, are the people who are having difficulty accessing medical services now. And it doesn't seem to matter how, how much other funding is going in. When you are actually a pensioner, and a particularly a pensioner living in a regional area, and we've had these letters from people who say, and I quote, 
My wife and I are pensioners, and unfortunately she is a regular visitor to a doctor. We are $210 out of pocket for medical treatment just for the last fortnight. I've had cancer for two years, and I'm meant to get yearly checkups. I haven't had one for the last three years because I just can't afford it. People are making decisions on a daily basis based on their money about whether in fact they can take the follow-up cancer treatments and visits that they require for their condition. Particularly people on fixed incomes are finding it really difficult to pay to go to their doctors because the doctors have ceased doing bulk billing. It used to be access to go and see your doctor when you need to and you wouldn't have to make any co-payment. However, when you have to find the money, the actual cash, every time you visit the doctor, you have to make financial decisions at every visit. This puts pressure on individuals, it puts pressure on families, and regardless about what's being done to maldistributions, regardless of what's being done to other forms of medical care, which of course the Minister has referred to in previous times in this place, that you can't divide her program into silos. You have to look at the whole programs. I'm looking at the whole programs, my constituents are looking at the whole programs, and the programs are not providing the services which they need. The whole area needs to be reconsidered. You can't close off one area and expect health to be funded effectively. It's not right that our, our people, particularly our elderly, the people who are on limited incomes, are not able to have the confidence to seek out effective medical care. This is a problem we need to actually face up to, stop trying to run away from it, and understand that the medical system needs to be overhauled. It's simply not working as it is now, and there is a chance to make a change. It's just likely that there's no willingness to make the change that's required. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, it's, it's interesting to, uh, to note some of the arguments that are being put across the chamber and, uh, it, and also to particularly note that bulk billing rates were actually worse under the last Labor government. And I think it's important to remember, to remember that. They seem to um, uh, claim credit for all sorts of things, but they also ought to uh, claim responsibility for the fact that uh, bulk billing rates were at least uh, were less, were, were less un, when they were in, in government. Um, Labor seemed to say that the answer to this solution is just to throw more money at the problem. And uh, as we've heard from um, um, colleagues earlier, it's, it's not just about money. Um, and Cl Senator Moore was saying just a moment ago about maldistribution, but uh, one of the, the issue really is, is more in, um, in uh, a, a matter of uh, doctor density rather than maldistribution that is, is an issue. Uh, where you have a high density of doctors, and it doesn't really matter whereabouts around the country, whether it's city or rural, if you've got a high density of doctors, you're going to have a higher rate of bulk billing. And so uh, I think uh, one of the issues that this government has uh, uh, really had a look at is how to correct that higher density issue within some of the uh, metropolitan areas in particular. Uh, and there are a couple of programs that are looking to do that, not just on a short-term basis, but actually on a longer-term basis. One of those, the More Doctors for Outer Metropolitan Areas measures, but one that I'd like to uh, speak about this afternoon is uh, the Rural Clinical Schools, which is a measure that the government uh, has put into place to provide on a longer-term basis uh, provision of doctors who have actually trained in rural areas uh, and uh, the research shows that uh, if a doctor comes from or has trained in a rural area, they're more likely to remain in that on the longer term. And uh, I had the privilege of attending a, um, a community board meeting of one of the rural clinical schools on the northwest coast of Tasmania last week. And uh, I think that uh, even at this very early stage, that there is a, a real demonstration of the likelihood of very positive outcomes from the Rural Clinical School program. It provides for not just doctors but for pharmacists uh, and dentists and optometrists uh, to train in a rural setting uh, and there are at this point in time some real uh, positives being demonstrated out of that particular program. 
Uh, during this meeting we actually had uh, one of the students from the school come to brief the board and to hear her describe the opportunities that she's had uh, in a very short period of time as part of uh, the rural clinical school that's been conducted at the uh, Burnie campus of the University of Tasmania on the north northwest coast were extremely heartening, I'd have to say. The smaller number of students were providing all of those people with access to patients which they wouldn't have normally got in a major metropolitan training hospital. And uh, the experiences that they were gaining uh, were, in her terms, uh, quite exciting. And the opportunity to talk to patients firsthand, uh, to experience um, procedures on a first-hand basis. And it seems uh, that um, one of the things that uh, really excites them, not just at this particular campus, but in some literature I was reading from other campuses as well, was uh, one uh, who's saying that uh, she'd actually delivered seven or eight babies. I mean, this, this seems to be a significant element as part of this program. But, the, but these students were um, made to feel that they were actually wanted. They were part of the system. They belonged and they weren't just an appendage to the system that, they, uh, that uh, uh, was how they were made to feel in another circumstance. They actually had a feeling of real worth and this was after a period of only months in the particular program. So it was bringing people back to a situation where they could study where they came from, back to close to where they, they lived. It was bringing people who hadn't experienced life in a regional area uh, into a regional hospital uh, and they were learning how, uh, what the benefits could be of A, training in a program such as this and, uh, and experiencing life in a regional area. Mr Acting Deputy President, a real positive program uh, and a real positive element that has come out of this government's attempts to ensure that... Senator Colbeck, your time has expired. Senator Stevens. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, I too rise to take note of uh, Senator Patterson's answer to my question this afternoon and um, to, I suppose, take umbrage at the comments that she made in terms of um, the visits by non-urgent conditions or, tr or patients with non-urgent conditions to the outpatients of... Uh, outpatients departments of hospitals and uh, her explanation being of course that, that there was a rise in um, concerns about meningococcal. I think that's a pretty spurious reason for a, a, a situation that I know exists all over rural and regional Australia and as Senator Moore suggested uh, in some city areas the, the one she qu quoted was Brisbane um, where bulk billing does actually or the lack of bulk billing does prevent people from actually making the uh, the effort and um, seeking what is quite a, quite quite necessary health care when uh, because they have to pay and they can't afford the bills um, Senator Knowles made the uh, the observation again today about um, the suggestion that uh, under when Dr. Blewett was the health minister under the Hawke government that um, that uh, bulk billing was not necessarily for everyone and it's interesting the selective quoting that's been going on during the last few days in this debate uh, the, the actual statement that Dr. Blewett made was that universality of cover is obviously desirable from an equity point of view. In a society as wealthy as ours, there should not be people putting off treatment because they cannot afford the bills. Basic health care should be the right of every Australian. And of course, Mr Deputy President, what we're seeing is that there are people putting off treatment because they can't afford the bills. I hear about them every week in my electorate office, about people who have been unable to um, access bulk billing, so therefore have left it longer and longer to attend to what then become fairly serious medical conditions. And Ms. Uh, Senator Patterson's suggestion that the reason for uh, the reduction in GP visits was because of our preventative health measures, I think is, um, it, in one respect is a good point in the sense that there have been 
um, very effective public health campaigns on the management of diabetes and asthma, and they were the two programs that she suggested. Senator Hill also suggested the issue about uh, smoking and tobacco education. But the fact is that people are not going to their GPs because they cannot afford the co-payment that's required um, in order to receive basic health care. Um, I, in terms of quoting what, uh, what some of pre previous people have been saying about uh, health care, in the previous government, the previous minister responding to a question about the univers universality of bulk billing was saying, this is something we've grappled with for over a decade and the party now is really unanimous on that. Medicare stays, universal bulk billing stays. These are the things that the Australian public demands and we accept that, in his quote. Well, the Prime Minister obviously doesn't accept that. His recent comments certainly fly in the face of that principle. Medicare ensures access by Australians to quality health care both by way of primary health care that the GP can deliver and in a public hospital, irrespective and independent of wealth and income. It leaves open to Australians the option of using disposable income if they opt for private health care, either with primary care or in a private hospital. Labor has, committed, is, has been committed to this and will remain so. I'm not too sure where Senator Colbeck got his figures, but that I'm quite sure that he is incorrect when he's saying that uh, under Labor the bulk billing dropped to below the current situation under this government. It was peaked at 80 per cent when Labor left office and under John Howard bulk billing rates have fallen every year. At the moment it's at a rate of about 69.6 per cent. The lowest bulk billing has been since 1989. And over this government's period, seven-year period, we've seen an 11 per cent decline in bulk billing, and over half of that has come in the last 12 months. And on top of that, we've seen the cost of co-payments uh, rising when John Howard came Your to office. Your time has expired, Senator Stevens. The question is that the motion moved by Senator McLucas be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it.